morning, and welcome to biology. I'm Paul Suchecki, and this is my classroom. It's great to see all your smiling faces again. The topic today is the structure of cells. Cells are fascinating, and scientists are slowly revealing their secrets. Scientists are trying to solve problems like cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's disease, just to name a few. I believe that the secret to solving these diseases is understanding the cell better. There's so much about cells that scientists don't know. When Robert Hooke looked at cork under a very crude microscope in 1665, he used the word cell to describe the little boxes that he saw, and the science of microbiology was first born. The invention of the microscope opened up a whole new miniature world of living things that scientists didn't even know existed. Hooke was pretty excited about his discovery, but cork cells aren't even living. Soon after, other scientists joined in. In 1675, Anton von Leeuwenhoek was the first person to look at living cells under a microscope. He must have been truly amazed the first time he saw a tiny living thing swimming around under his microscope. I bet it looked like a Listerine commercial. Well, he got so excited about this tiny living world that he started looking at everything he could under his microscope, even his own blood. And then other scientists became interested in this new microbiology. Over the next century or so, a new idea began to take shape called the cell theory. The cell theory goes something like this. All living things are made of one or more cells. The cell is the basic unit of life. Cells come only from pre-existing cells. This seems like common knowledge in the 21st century, but in the 17th and 18th century, this was a new and exciting discovery. The cell is the smallest unit that can carry on all processes of life. In other words, the cell is the basic unit of life. You've got many different types of cells in your body, and not all cells are the same size and shape. So why are cells so small? Cells are small because it gives them a very high surface area to volume ratio. Huh? The smaller the cell, the higher the surface area to volume ratio. The higher the surface area to volume ratio, the more efficient the cell is at taking in nutrients and getting rid of waste. As the cell grows, its volume increases rapidly, but its surface area only increases slightly. The larger the cell, the smaller the surface area to volume ratio. So what determines the shape of a cell? The shape of a cell is directly related to its function. For example, skin cells are flat because they cover the body. Nerve cells are long and thin because they carry electrical messages. There's an old saying in biology, form follows function. In other words, the shape of a cell is directly related to its function. In this wild, wacky, crazy, mixed up world of ours, there's basically two kinds of cells, prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells are much smaller and simpler than eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are more complex. Eukaryotic cells keep their DNA in a structure called a nucleus, just for protection. Along with the nucleus, eukaryotic cells have other membrane-bound structures called organelles. Organelles are like the little organs of a cell. Animals, plants, fungi, and protists are all eukaryotic. Prokaryotic cells do have DNA, but it's not protected inside a nucleus. It's just kind of floating around in the liquid of the cell. Prokaryotic cells have no membrane-bound organelles. Bacteria are prokaryotic. We'll talk about bacteria later. But for the rest of this chapter, we're going to focus in on just the eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are more complex. You are made of eukaryotic cells. Get it? You and you? The outer layer of the cell is the cell membrane, sometimes called the plasma membrane. It's the border of the cell. It keeps what's in, in, and what's out, out. The cell membrane is made of lipid, two layers. We call it a lipid bilayer. There are tiny little holes or pores in the cell membrane, kind of like in your skin. The cell membrane is what we call selectively permeable or semi-permeable. A selectively permeable membrane allows certain materials to pass through, but not others. It's kind of like the cell's gatekeeper. The cell membrane is selective about what comes in and what goes out. It's selectively permeable. There are protein globules embedded in the lipid bilayer. These protein globules have various functions. Some of them are used to transport large materials across the membrane. Other proteins are used to identify what kind of cell it is. It's one way that your body can tell which cells belong and which cells don't belong. If a foreign bacteria cell invades your body, your immune system can tell that it doesn't belong because it has different proteins than the proteins on your cells. Once your immune system figures out that that cell doesn't belong, it can attack and kill it. Your blood type 
is partly determined by the proteins on your red blood cells. Some people have type A proteins on their red blood cells. Type A blood. Some people have type B proteins on their red blood cells. Type B blood. Some people have both type A and type B proteins on their red blood cells. Type AB. Some people have neither A nor B proteins on their red blood cells, and they would be type O. If type B blood was placed into somebody who had type A, bad things would happen. The body of the type A person would recognize the type B blood cells as foreign. Their immune system would respond by destroying those blood cells. The liquid part of the cell is called cytoplasm, or sometimes cytosol. Cytoplasm is mostly water, but there's lots of stuff dissolved in it, so it's kind of a thick liquid. There are organelles floating around in the cytoplasm. Organelles are like the little organs that make up the cell. Your body's made of organs, but cells don't have organs. Instead, they have organelles, little organs. The nucleus is like the brain of the cell. It's the control center of the cell. The nucleus is surrounded by a nuclear membrane. The nuclear membrane is a double bilayer, four layers of lipid, sometimes called the nuclear envelope. I guess they call it that because it envelops the nucleus. You know, if I was gonna send a letter and I wanted it to get there really fast, I would use a nuclear envelope. The liquid of the nucleus is called nucleoplasm. It's kind of like cytoplasm, but thicker. Inside the nucleus, there's a smaller structure called the nucleolus. The nucleolus is like a little nucleus inside the nucleus. The job of the nucleolus is to make ribosomes. The nucleus holds the DNA, the genetic material of life. A chromosome is a bundle of DNA. Ribosomes are organelles that manufacture protein. They're like little protein factories of the cell. Usually ribosomes are floating freely in the cytoplasm. We call these free-floating ribosomes. But sometimes ribosomes are attached to another organelle called endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum. It's one of my favorite terms in all of biology. Endoplasmic reticulum is sometimes called ER, but be careful. Somebody might think you mean emergency room. There are two kinds of endoplasmic reticulum, smooth and rough. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum has no ribosomes attached to it. That's why it looks smooth under the microscope. Smooth. Rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes attached to it. That's why it looks rough under the microscope. Rough, rough. The endoplasmic reticulum is an internal network of passageways that allows the cell to transport things within the cell. If materials stay inside the cell, they take the endoplasmic reticulum. Sometimes materials like protein have to leave the cell to be used in another part of the body. This is the job of the Golgi apparatus. The Go-Go-Golgi. The ribosomes manufacture the protein. They hand it off to the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum transports it over to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus packages it up and ships it out of the cell. Same day delivery. All of this activity requires energy. Energy for the cell is provided by the mitochondria. Mitochondria is like the power plant of the cell. You know, the mighty mitochondria. Mighty! Mitochondria provide energy for the cell through a process called cellular respiration. During cellular respiration, glucose is broken down and the energy stored in glucose is released into the cell. And then this energy is what drives all of the processes of the cell. Cellular respiration is a complex process that goes something like this. C6H12O6 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. Cells in the body that have a very high energy demand, like muscle cells or brain cells or liver cells, could have up to thousands of mitochondria per cell. Some cells, like skin cells, are less active, and they might only have dozens of mitochondria. If you feel like you don't have enough energy, maybe you don't have enough mitochondria. The way you tell your body to make more mitochondria is by exercising. One of the ways that your body responds to regular exercise is your cells produce more mitochondria. The more mitochondria you have, the more energy your body can produce. Lysosomes are organelles that contain strong digestive enzymes. Their job is to destroy unwanted cells. An unwanted cell could be a bacteria cell that's getting into your body, could make you sick, and so lysosomes help destroy those unwanted cells. Another example of an unwanted cell could be an old, worn-out cell that belongs to your body. So the body releases a lysosome or two into the cell, the digestive enzymes remove that unwanted cell, and a new cell takes its place. Some cells have cilia. Cilia are short hair-like projections used for locomotion. Some unicellular organisms have cilia. 
and they use their cilia kind of like paddles to swim through the water. In humans, we have cilia on cells that line the inside of our windpipe when we breathe in air. Sometimes we breathe in dust along with it, and this dust gets in our lungs. The cilia in our windpipe help sweep this dust out of our lungs. A flagellum is a single hair-like structure used for locomotion. Some unicellular organisms have a flagellum. They wave their flagella back and forth, kind of like a fish's tail, and this propels them through the water. The only human cell that has a flagellum is a sperm cell. Animal cells have a support structure called a cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made of microtubules and microfilaments. These microtubules and microfilaments act almost like a scaffolding system that give the cell internal support. Without the cytoskeleton, the cell would just be a bag of goo. Plant cells don't have a cytoskeleton. Instead, they have a cell wall. The cell wall is not the same as the cell membrane. The cell membrane is the border of the cell, and the cell wall is located outside the cell membrane. So actually, the cell wall is outside of the cell. It's extracellular. Think of it this way. Let's say you took a balloon and you put it inside of a box. As you blow up the balloon, the balloon fills the box and takes the shape of the box. The balloon represents the cell membrane. The box represents the cell wall. The cell membrane is soft and flexible and it's made of lipid. The cell wall is hard and rigid. It's made of cellulose. Plant cells have organelles called vacuoles. Vacuoles are storage organelles. Usually vacuoles are used to store water, but vacuoles can store other things too. Vacuoles can store protein, waste products, lipids. They can store anything. Plants are rooted in the ground, and they can't just get up and go get a drink. So they keep a little extra water in their vacuoles, you know, on reserve. Good idea. Another organelle that plant cells have that animal cells don't are called chloroplasts. Chloroplasts contain a green pigment called chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is what gives a plant the ability to do photosynthesis. During photosynthesis, plants take carbon dioxide in through their leaves. They take water in through their roots. With the help of sunlight and chlorophyll, they produce glucose and oxygen. Glucose is their food. The oxygen is released into the atmosphere. Some people think photosynthesis is the most important chemical reaction on Earth, and I agree. All of our food comes from photosynthesis, either directly or indirectly. All of our breathable oxygen comes from photosynthesis. I don't know about you, but I like food and oxygen. I think plants just made my friend list. Some organisms are unicellular, which means they're only made of one cell. So they have to do all of the jobs of an organism with just one cell. You think you got it rough. In multicellular organisms like you and me, the labor of staying alive is divided up. There are different cell types that have different jobs. For example, you have skin cells and muscle cells and bone cells and heart cells and liver cells and kidney cells and eyeball cells and big toe cells and all kinds of cells and they all have different jobs to do. A liver cell doesn't do what a brain cell does. A muscle cell doesn't do what a skin cell does. Each cell type has a specific function. As long as all the different cell types do their job, then the entire organism stays alive and healthy. This is called division of labor or cell specialization. In a true multicellular organism, there are many cell types and each cell type has a specific job. If even one cell type stops working, the entire organism could die. Volvox is a colonial organism in the kingdom Protista. It's made of many cells, so it's not unicellular, but it's not considered multicellular either because Volvox doesn't show division of labor. All the cells in a Volvox are basically the same. When a sperm cell and an egg cell join, they form a zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg, but the zygote is gonna divide and divide many times. In the earliest stages of development, all of the cells look basically the same. Those cells could become anything, and as they develop, they specialize and become certain types of cells. Stem cells are unspecialized cells that could become any type of cell in the body. It's like they haven't decided what they want to be yet. There's a great deal of research being done on stem cells, and the possibilities are pretty exciting. Scientists are trying to grow new organs in laboratories. Can you imagine? Some people need a new kidney, or they need a new liver, or they need a new heart. And these people are very sick and in hospitals, and they're waiting for new organs. Well, the only place to get these organs is from other people who don't need them anymore. You know what I mean. And many people wait years to receive an organ, and some people never do, and they die waiting. Sometimes the donor organ and the recipient aren't compatible. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just grow them a new organ in a laboratory? And maybe one day we won't need organ donors. 
we're not there yet. As scientists research and discover more things about cells, they're going to find cures for diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer and diabetes. In the 21st century, we're kind of standing on the brink of discovery. I believe in your lifetime, you're going to see some amazing discoveries in the field of cell biology. Well, that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to leave it right there for now. So until next time, don't get lost. Have a great day. I'll see you later.